Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIEA. I'm very pleased to welcome you for this afternoon's webinar. We're really happy to be joined today by Njoke Wamai, Assistant Professor in the International Relations Department at the United States International University, Africa, who I'm delighted has been able to take time out of her schedule to speak to us. I'm excited for a couple of reasons. This is the first event in the IIEA's inaugural EU Africa series. And what better place to start than looking at Kenya and looking at it with Njoki. I'm also really delighted that Njoki and I were students together during our, our PhD at Cambridge. And I'm unsurprised to see the, the great heights to which Professor Omae has, has risen. But it's just really nice for me to, to be meeting here in this context and on this you know, important moment to inaugurate what I think is going to be a really important part of the IIA's work going forward. Professor Omaye is going to speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go as ever to the all important questions and answers with our audience. So please get your questions ready. You'll be able to join the discussion as ever using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can once the presentation is finished. A reminder that, today, that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. And please, as ever, feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Before handing the floor over to Professor Omae, I will briefly introduce her. And Jokyu Omae, PhD, is Assistant Professor in the International Relations Department at the United States International University, Africa. Njoki is a postdoctoral, was a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Governance and Human Rights at the Politics and International Studies Department at the University of Cambridge, where she completed her PhD in Politics and International Studies as a prestigious Gates Scholar in 2017. Previously, Dr. Omae was a Peace, Security and Development Scholar at the African Leadership Center at King's College London. She's published book chapters and articles with Oxford University Press, Routledge and Z books on international intervention, the International Criminal Court, mediation and violence using post-colonial and decolonial approaches, to name only a few. Joki, it's a real pleasure. I pass you the floor for about 20 minutes. Looking forward. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. It's really indeed um, such a pleasure uh, doing this together with IIEA and also, of course, with my longtime friend and comrade, Barry. So as Barry, I think, has introduced me, I am right now in Nairobi after Cambridge, where I work as a, as a lecturer uh, here in Nairobi in the United States International University. But I'm also a fellow at the Wissenschafts College in Berlin. My presentation, I am going to be talking about Kenyan elections, which I'm sure most of you uh, were following last year that happened on August 7th um, last year. And also in terms of what were the stakes involved, what were the implications of the win, and what are the continued implications of this, um, of, of the Kenyan elections last year, especially also for the European Union and its relations with not just uh, Kenya, but also probably East Africa and Africa. If we are to think about Kenya and, the, and what happened with, I'm going to come to the elections, but I thought I would first give a small historical context to the Kenyan elections of 2022, August last year. So this was the, is it the fourth election after the, the constitution, we passed a new constitution in 2010. And Kenya now, we, I would call it a growing democracy. Of course, it's growing in a lot of, lots of pains because we have a history, a long history of divisive politics, uh, largely along ethnic lines since, and it's been for a long time. We could even say since the colony of the British colonial occupation, which ended in 1963, uh, because the British, of course, I mean, divided groups of people who, different nations, if you go even back to, to Berlin, what happened in, in 1884, the division of different types, different nations across, across borders, 
And so, and, and so with that, we, we inherited the crisis of what many African countries have, what I would, I would call the crisis of the nation state. So unlike what we have seen in Ireland or, you know, or in, in Europe, of course, now with globalization and immigration, things are changing. We have a very different idea of, uh, of the nation state, which more of half the time really doesn't exist. And so with that um, legacy of colonialism and also, of course, the British occupation, we've always, the state has always been contested along the different nationalities that exist. And these groups are forced to live is in one country called Kenya or Uganda or whatever, or Somalia. Uh, or I mean, Somalia, despite, of course, being one uh, big nation and one ethnic nation, but kind of like what is happening right now in Ethiopia, again, different nations existing with, with the idea of the modern uh, European state. And so that legacy continues to dog lots of African countries and, and, and elections are usually that space of recontestation, again, contestation of, of, the, of, of the state by the different nations. And so that crisis continues, the crisis of the nation state. And so 2007 and eight, we had violence, uh, which was quite um, probably unprecedented. Uh, previously, uh, the kind of violence we saw was uh, during the colonial or period, again, the British colonialism. So 2007 also we had uh, violence again, because of the elections, as I said, elections are a time for contestation again, back to the nation state crisis, because it's the different nations coming to vote and, you know, and so this led to, of course, an intervention after, after the election intervention, whether it was the International Criminal Court, uh, mediation by Kofi Annan and others, and eventually um, to resolve that crisis, uh, long term, we needed to have a new constitutional uh, disposition that would address the, these divisions, divisions especially along ethnicity or the different nations that exist, and also institutional reform because lots, lots of violence was committed by organizations like the police. There was a lot of uh, also need for judicial reforms because corruption, so, and also reducing the power of the president who was quite powerful. So the passing of the 2010 constitution was also a very critical juncture in the development of this constitutional democracy in Kenya. Uh, but elite fragmentation and cooptation continued despite our very good constitution. And Kenya is seen to have one of the best constitutions in Africa, only, only maybe, um, Another country with a very good constitution is South Africa, but the Kenyan one also has been seen to be pretty good after 2010. But despite a good constitution, implementation is a problem. It has not um, really solved those issues that it intended to solve. But as we say, democracies are so gradual and sometimes they are so slow. So increased, uh, there's in continued increased elite fragmentation and cooptation, largely driven by individual interest for power. So this has encouraged very weak political parties and so lacking, which lack stable ideological, ideological um, stands. So like, unlike what you may have, for instance, in Ireland or in greater Europe, you know, with very clear ideological, if you look at the spectrum, the left and the right, and you can tell, you can see how, how clear that is. So in Kenya, it's quite difficult. I'm actually right now teaching a class in political science. And like, I think two weeks ago, we were talking about political ideology. And it's very, very hard, even when we start thinking which parties on the left or on the right, like in Kenya, and not just in Kenya, in many, many African countries maybe apart from the countries that are driven by like liberation movements like South Africa, uh, next door here, Tanzania. But for us, it's, it's very hard, even when you look at. So most of these parties are very weak in their formation. In fact, somebody called them vehicles. We can't call them political parties because it's something you enter to drop you. It's like a, it's like a bus that you get in and it drops you to the next stop and you can decide to pick another bus or, you know, or drop that new, or, you know, get rid of that bus and get another one and put a new name for the bus. And as long as it can get you to win the election. So weak political parties, which lack stable ideological stance, 
And so they are all playing, half the time they are playing musical chairs. As you see, party elites unite, they unite with their uh, former enemies, and then they, they break again, and then they unite with new friends. It's almost like a game, you know? So Kenyan politics, largely because it is personality driven around these ethnic nations that we are talking about. So it's about making coalitions that can help you win. And so if you can get, uh, uh, if you can get the tyranny of numbers, the numbers from your ethnic nation, and then you, you get a coalition with the other big group, you're good to go, you win an election. But, so this has been the contest of uh, the, before the 2002 election. Hence, we had 82 political parties. Can you imagine? I mean, Kenya is not such a small country, of course. It's double the size of um, Great Britain, but still a population of 50 million people, 82 political parties. Of course, largely, probably only three of these political parties are, are, are big enough. Uh, probably you can put the slide on the musical chairs and you can see those political parties there and how like this jubilee you can see it's on both sides and how it moved to this other side of odm and the the, the blue voters that's the odm side led by raila odinga and then the other side uh, was led by william ruto kenya kwanza as you can see kenya kwanza just means kenya first kwanza means first in kiswahili and in Jokia, you meant to have your slides up. Yes, yes. Yeah, That's Jokia, and if you can make it happen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I didn't uh, know that. No so problem. the slide with the many political parties. The next, uh, the, yeah, that one, musical chairs. So the previous one. Yeah, musical chairs. That's uh, so this, so, so because of those uh, weak political parties, fragmentation, as you can see, uh, like I was just giving the example of this Jubilee party, the red uh, logo with two hands, two people clasping their hands and how it moves, it has moved from one side to another uh, because these were the two leading coalitions. Also, it's very hard to win an election now without uh, the, the, the coalitions. And so, so with that political parties, as you can see are, it's as I was saying, it's like playing musical chairs. You become friends with this one, you break up, you you leave, you join the next. So we don't have stable parties based on any ideology. You'll find both all parties will have a kind of they'll have what you would see in left parties as they, they they'll advocate for maybe strong government and also what you would see in more libertarian and, and liberal parties, individual rights, but not quite. Like for instance, maybe they would support rights for LGBTQ, but you know, so they're all, it's like a mishmash of everything, but we don't really have, I can't call Jubilee or the ones we had like this Azimio in blue, a left party, though it seemed more left, or the, the guys in yellow called Kenya Kwanza, uh, 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 also a right, it's, it was still right wing with very conservative ideas, but also very left because they supported uh, the poor. And so because of that, as I, as I think the point I was trying to make is how, how fractured our political parties are. And it becomes very hard to think through them, even ideologically and very weak. So with that, of course, with uh, the next slide, you can see these were the leading contenders. Uh, that is William Ruto and, uh, and Raila Odinga. And, and then on one side, the, the two in blue is, is the former president, Kenyatta, with Raila Odinga. So Odinga now, who was the enemy or the, was, they were against each other in the last election of 2017 with Kenyatta, they became best of friends in this election. And so despite him being kind of the opposition candidate, he had the support of the government, the establishment. And the deputy president, who is this William Ruto, on the left became the um, the next slide with the big billboards became the kind of the leading um, or rather the, he he was he looked like the person in opposition despite him being in government so so that's um, so that's what so you can see those even how how much 
they invest and they invested in 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 election campaigning i i think when i lived in the uk i never saw you know people campaigning on billboards despite uh despite elections so you know, despite the elections i think that we 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 saw when we who when we lived in the uk so but you can see um this is also part of the problem we are seeing with the context of our elections so one of the things in the 2022 elections, not just in Kenya, I mean, not just 2022, but also the previous elections that have characterized our elections is high stakes and big money, which is a big problem. So Kenyan elections, though they are largely free, free but you know, uh, like opposition politicians, you will not find them being arrested or you know being prevented from campaigning like what ha has happened in Uganda or Tanzania it's largely free, though fair is a, a bit contested. So Kenyan elections are largely free, but the most expensive in the region because they are dominated by personalities, their ethnic followers and big money. And the challenge with that, it encourages only rich families. There's and this term in Kenya that is also common in South Africa called tenderpreneurs. So people who make money through government tenders, you know, uh, so bidding, and most of the time it's politicians and their families or people connected to politicians. So, so our politics over time, especially after that 2010 constitution, it has become largely transactional, very transactional because of the big money and big stakes involved. And part of the reason also why there's big money and high stakes is also because our elections tend to be very, uh, our politicians are paid a lot of money, $10,000 a month. Can you imagine in a country where 36% of people earn $57 a month, you know, they live below the poverty line. So there's a group of people who earn $10,000 and it's public money. So it's very, very sad. But because of that, so people who are never interested in politics are suddenly interested in politics and are willing to invest anything. So Kenyan elections are also found to be some, the most elect, expensive elections in Africa. I mean, uh, I mean, one of the countries with the most expensive elections in Africa. And there's a research conducted last year by one of the political scientists and it found that to be a member of parliament, you need 220,000 US dollars you know, to run a campaign. And it, and it goes on from there. To be a senator, you need $320. So you can imagine to be a governor, it's probably uh, half a million dollars. So our elections are very expensive and it's largely because of the big money and the big money you think you will make once you become a politician, but also because the electorate has not yet quite understood this idea of a liberal democracy that you elect people to represent you, to do mainly three functions, oversight, legislation, it's oversight, legislation, and um, what's the other one? I can't remember, but it's really oversight and legislation and representation. So most of our electorate still believes politics is you elect somebody to go and bring you development money back, you know, back to the constituency. And if they're going to be earning $10,000, then they need to be also paying for, for instance, if your child is sick or you have a funeral or you have, you know, so personal kind of needs, which are really not personal. The state also should be helping to take care of these welfare needs. So politicians have to use most of their money in, in addressing these very personal and welfare needs of their constituents. Otherwise, they are not voted in again. So even if you go to parliament, you make the best laws for your people who have the time, they don't care. They'll say, you never sent me money for funeral X or you know my child uh, school fees or something. So there are all these challenges also with our kind of politics. Um, and also borrowing the Westminster kind of politics, I think without thinking contextually what uh, that politics for us or representation means also taking care of people's needs. So it's a bit complicated. Also the, that election, uh, the context was also high inflation, high inequality, largely the cost of living inflation increasing everywhere in the world after uh, the war in Ukraine and a widening inequality gap, especially in Kenya, as there's you know, big money. Kenya has attracted all these global companies in Nairobi, Google, um, I mean, think of any big company, they all come in to set up shop in Nairobi. 
Nairobi is seen as the Silicon Savannah of Africa, so high tech industry. So there's also a very a widening gap of inequality. The UN, uh, UN, one of the UN headquarters, UNEP, is in Nairobi. So there's, of course, all this global capital, and the economy is connected to global capital. Of course, not as largely as other, um, say, South Africa or others, but it's it's quite huge. And so there's a widening inequality gap. With this kind of people, whether it's in the corporate sector or whatever, earning so much money, and as I said, that six percent of the population earning only fifty-seven dollar a month. So also there's, but with despite all these challenges, uh, there's of increasing improvement of institutions, separation of power. There's a strong judiciary. There was a strong judiciary. That's why even despite the elections and the contestation that uh, exists uh, that came up after the last year's election there was a lot of belief in the judiciary and even after what the judiciary decided that Ruto has won nobody uh, went to the streets you know they said it's okay we have accepted so that's progress i think that is a, is a growing democracy also in this 2002 election we saw the waning allure of ethnic politics these ethnic nations and like 2007, 2013, and 2017, um, ethnic, this eth people, young people, I think there's a huge also, there's a huge, what you call youth bulge, increasing population of young people. And so there's a, there was a huge division of young people, for instance, who did not vote, voter apathy. So 8 million people did not vote in Kenya, yet they were registered. So that tells you a lot. There's a group of many people who are highly, highly disenfranchised with elections, voting, politics, and they just don't care anymore because they feel we vote these guys, they go and earn 10,000 US dollars while we are still here dying of, you know, uh, preventable diseases and very, and even, even hunger. But so there's, there's that apathy among uh, voters, not just uh, not just youth voters, of course, youth largely, because there's also a growing population of young people with no jobs, but who, has, who are also made a case. And I think that's a lot of agency. Uh, and, and it's uh, important because then it shows they're delegitimizing even the leadership that exists. So youth and class in this election last year became a, also a, a way, of, a, a different way of organizing. Economic inequality became a new dimension. Uh, with increasing unemployment among the youth. So many young people would say, I'm voting for, for instance, this hustler, the person who was speaking to their needs. Um, and so class is, is, is increasingly becoming a, a, a space for organizing, uh, unlike previously where people voted largely along their ethnic nations. So women's representation is still low, but it's also within 2022, we saw election, uh, women increase. We had three deputy presidents, women. Uh, and there's a slide there for the women, for the for the running mates, increased women in politics. So this, the, the main parties that were running, we had three women, mainly two. One uh, very powerful woman, the one on the left side, uh, Martha Karua, she's been in politics maybe since 1992, since I can remember. So she's considered the iron lady of Kenyan politics. And, uh, but her, her, her coalition with Odinga, they did not win the, or rather they did not win the election. So there's increased women uh, representation. We have seven governors who won the election, 29 members of parliament, another 47 members from the, from the uh, what they call the quarter. So if we go to the results, the hustlers had it. So we had two groups of people. Uh, maybe you can put the slide with the hustlers versus dynasties newspaper. Two groups of people that became very, um, the campaign was around these two, uh, the hustler versus the dynasty. So William Ruto created, created this, um, not just William Ruto, but these people who are, those who are especially campaigning for the two main groups. So it was William Ruto versus Raila Odinga and William Ruto um, claimed to be the self-made hustler who was better placed to understand the grievances of the poor despite being one of Kenya's wealthiest politicians. And he's, it's alleged that most of his wealth is through corruption. And he drew a contrast between himself and his poor upbringing because he's always like, I was born poor, I used to sell chicken, 
when I went to university, I couldn't raise my fees, so I was a chicken seller. And he, he, so he created this contrast between himself and the privileged Odinga, Odinga and Kenyatta, because now the previous president was supporting his four turned Ale Kenyatta. And he called these groups political dynasties or this group of these two and aristocrats, given how their political careers have benefited from their fathers, both their fathers were the liberation heroes uh, or the liberation fathers of, uh, from the British. So Jomo Kenyatta, and his deputy Jaramogi Odinga. So the two, the, the dynasty side, of course, dismissed Ruto as a thief, as a, a alleged, alleging that he's a thief. But um, anyway, he still went ahead. The the, the so-called uh, dynasty, uh, what do you call it? The hustler went ahead and won the election, and um, he was declared the winner of the 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 election was contested by the dynasties, political dynasties in court, and in court, of course the election results were upheld, largely because also this election used a lot of technology. And so our elections also, again, even at the level of technical, it's, they're the most expensive. I think in the previous election, 2017, I, I read somewhere that uh, per capita, per person, the election cost us $25, compared to like the United Kingdom where the election costs less than $5 per person. So in this other new election, I mean, 22, 22, probably it even went to $35. So they were using a lot of digital devices. And also they had, of course, very high tech servers. So one of the good things about this election, everybody could tally the election votes because it was an open uh, portal. So what are the implications of William Ruto's win? On the economy, of course, there's, uh, there's now, it came in with a lot of uh, promises to deal with inflation. Uh, prices of uh, the, the the staple in Kenya is called ugali, so it's a maize meal, maize meal where you eat with um, meat or vegetables, what would be like Irish potatoes in Ireland. But so the inflation continues with the continuing war, of course, in Ukraine and reduced funding of to African countries from the EU and and investment, and so Ruto in his uh, wisdom or luck, I don't know, has introduced what he has called the hustler fund. So remember, he's a hustler. So he has all these hustler things. So the hustler funds, which are to provide soft loans for micro entrepreneurs, very cheap, probably up to even $5. You can borrow $10 a day. And it's through Kenyans are very digital service. So it's through the phone. And so critics have, of course, questioned this and they're questioning, should the state be involved in dishing loans to people? They should give that to the private sector. But I think for him, he's trying to champion more economic nationalism and more role of the state involvement in um, uh, provide provision of, of, of goods and services. So he has also promised to end human rights violations. Mm. Uh, because he, uh, the, the Ruto regime claims that the past regime, of course, jailed or tried to, to arrest a bunch of his supporters for corruption allegations. Most of those corruption cases, unfortunately, have been dropped in this new, in this new regime. And he has appointed some of those people who are, who are, who are um, uh, charged for corruption back as ministers and public officers. And some of those cases have been withdrawn. So that is a very scary. Uh, and, and so that um, lots of civil society groups and lots of critics are challenging that, but they keep saying they were, they were arrested wrongfully by the previous regime, but uh, we don't know. So, and also in terms of foreign policy, Kenya continues to be an, impo an important partner, not just in the UN Security Council, which is a member, um, but also in the African Union. Uh, working also with the African East African community and Western states, largely, especially in the fight against countering violent extremism, and also because of its role as a business hub with the uh, technology, especially big tech companies, and increasingly now even with these issues on climate change, which have gotten a lot of support uh, from the European Union. So his foreign policy seems to follow his predecessors. He doesn't seem to have shifted dramatically uh, from his past. And so on, on even on, on, the, so on the fight against uh, dealing with uh, uh, violent extremism, he's still working with the US and, and, and European Union countries. 
and he's been attending, of course, all important meetings um, to do with uh, for, uh, foreign policy making. So it seems nothing much is changing in terms of that. China, of course, continues to be a huge uh, investor, uh, not just in Kenya, but also in other African countries. And he doesn't also seem to be changing any of that. So that remains. I think um, I will end at that because I can see my time is over and I will hear the your questions.